Hey, what's up, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to episode 10 of the Undiscovered Games video podcast, where we take a look at the lesser known board games of the world and share those with you. Today, we're going to go way back in time to 1994 with this beautifully produced game by Milton Bradley called Quandary. Now, some of you might know this, but this was actually designed by Dr. Reiner Knizia, but his name is nowhere to be found on the box itself. You actually have to look at the very bottom of the rule sheet in tiny print. It says invented by Dr. Reiner Knizia. Now, 1994 was still fairly early in Knizia's game design career. So I just found that kind of interesting because nowadays, you know, anytime he puts out a game, his name is going to be front and center on the box because he's easily one of the most well well-known and recognizable game designers in the world. So I just find that kind of cool that there's a game out there without his name on the box that he designed. Now this game was later re-released under several other titles. One of them was called Loco, but probably the most well-known edition of the game was called Wildlife Safari, otherwise known as Botswana. They had a lot of titles for this game. They couldn't quite decide on a theme, I guess. The game doesn't really need a theme. It's just numbers and colors, and that's all you really need and that's why I like this quandary edition because it doesn't try to be something it's not but the Botswana game is kind of cool and I actually have a copy of that as well and I'll show you that at the end of the video it has these cool little animal figures in it which is kind of neat now the back of the box you see this guy here scheming and hesitating I love these old box backs with the people you know having a good time satisfying Another adjective I would use is addicting because this game is so simple. It's so easy to learn, but it just keeps you coming back for more. Let's look inside this cool shaped box here. As we open it up, we find a one page colorful rule sheet. The game is so easy to teach. It will take me like one minute to teach you the rules. Trifold board, gotta love the look of this. Just so old school. It really takes you back to a simpler time when you open this box these chunky tile holders, one for each player. You have the old mail-in sheets here and the score pad, gotta have that. I love that they include a score pad. And here we have the pride and joy of this game, these heavy duty domino style Bakelite tiles that are thick and double engraved. Both sides are engraved. I just can't believe how overproduced this game is because it's such a simple, fast game. It does not need to be this well produced, but it just looks great. And here we have the number tiles. These are numbered zero through five in five different colors. And again, these are fully engraved and painted. I mean, it's hard to find games nowadays that look this good and feel this good. So hats off to Milton Bradley on this one. To set up the game, you're gonna mix all these tiles face down, and then you're gonna to refer to the rule sheet based on your player count. So we're gonna do a four player setup here, and you're gonna deal seven squares per player, and you're gonna have two squares left over. So you're gonna deal seven of these out at random. Again, these are numbered zero through five in the five different colors, and you're always gonna have two left over, so you can never be quite sure you know, which numbers are still out there. Now you're gonna fill in the middle sections with the rectangular quandary tiles. So there's six of these in each color and you're gonna make a stack on the appropriate spots here on the board like this. And now you're ready to play. Quandary lasts three or four rounds depending on the number of players. So if you have an even number of players, it's gonna be four rounds. And if you have three players, it's going to be three rounds. So every player is gonna get a chance to go first. So just figure out who's gonna go first and then you're ready to begin. Now, on your turn, you're only going to do two things, and you always do these two things in this order. First, you place any one of your numbered squares out onto one of these paths, matching the color. So here we have the yellow path and the red path, and as you can see, you start at the end there, and then you work toward the middle. So every time you add a new tile of that color, you place it closer and closer to the center. After you place a tile, then you take any one of these rectangular quandary tiles from the middle. It does not have to be the same color as the number tile that you played. So you could play a blue five and then take a yellow rectangular tile. It does not have to match. Then the next player will place a tile and take a tile and you just keep doing that until one of these pathways fills up completely. That ends the round and then we score. And basically the way scoring works is you look at the last number showing on each path and that's how much each of these tiles is worth in that color. And I'll show you that here in a minute. 
So basically, if this player were to go first, they're gonna look at their tiles. Now the number five tile is a very powerful tile. You wanna get that toward the end of the row and make those blue tiles worth more. So it's good to kind of hold on to your fives and zeros are also powerful because you can destroy the value of your opponent's colors. Like if somebody's going for green, you could play that zero and destroy the value of those green tiles. So fives and zeros are good to hold on to in this game, but you can choose to start with any number or color you wish. So let's say it's this bottom corner player's turn to go first. They're looking through their tiles there and maybe they want to play this I don't know, this green one to start off. So they play a green one and now they can take any tile. Now remember, they have the five blue and they also have the four blue. So there's a good chance that they can get one of those out later on the blue path. So they're gonna start stocking up on blues. So they're gonna take one blue and then it becomes the next player's turn. Now you always keep those quandary tiles visible so everybody can see what colors you have. This player here has a red five, so they might want to stock up on reds early on. They're looking at their tiles. You want to start kind of somewhere in the middle so you're not being too obvious of what you want to go for early on. So they're going to put a white three and they could take a red or maybe a green because they do have a green four down there. So that's a good you know, opportunity to maybe end strong with green. Then this player is going to look and place one tile and take one color. And you just keep doing this, you know, placing one numbered tile and taking one rectangle tile. Keep going around the table until one of these pathways fills up completely and that will end the round. Now, this is one of those games that when you first learn it, you're like, that's all there is to it. That's it. You know, it seems way too simple to be fun. But I promise you, the more you play this, you know, these subtleties just really shine in this game where you're looking around and you're trying to figure out, you know, who has the high numbers. You know, that player over there has a lot of blue tiles. I bet they have a high blue number and they're waiting to play it. So maybe I'll take some blue tiles because I'm betting that they have a good number. But you can use that against your opponents too and sort of bluff your way through this. Or maybe you notice a player hasn't even touched, you know, the red stack and you're thinking, I bet they have a one or a zero in red and they're trying to wait to the right moment to destroy the value of red. So maybe I need to force the issue on the blue track and try to end the round quicker before they can do that to red. So there's all these little mind games you're playing with your opponents. You know, it's more than just place a tile, draw a tile. It's like there's, there's bluffing, there's timing and pacing. It's just very tricky to figure out, you know, the exact right moment to play a certain number or to take a certain color from the middle. It's just brilliantly designed. The subtleties are there from beginning to end. You have these tense decisions, it's bluffing, there's timing and pacing, all these great little nuances that really don't come through until you sit down and play the game. It's hard to even show you in a video. You have to sit down and experience the game and you will feel that tension between the players. I love it. So as these pathways fill up, it gets even more tense and you really have to commit. You know, you never know exactly what your opponents have because you always have those two unknown tiles that didn't make it into the game. But let's just say this player here already has a yellow tile. They have the five and they're gonna go ahead and end the round. So by placing that there, they have immediately determined the value of every color because now the round is over. Now this player still gets to take a tile from the middle, so obviously they're gonna take a yellow because that's gonna be worth the most points, but now we do scoring. So looking at the board, you look at the last number on each path, five points per yellow, one point per red, two points per white, two points per green, and one point per blue. So this player is like, oh, I needed one more turn to play that blue five, but they waited too long. So they're only gonna get three plus two for their green. So that's only five points. This player over here in the corner, they have two white tiles worth two points each. They have a green tile worth two points, so we're at six and their yellow tile is worth five. So that's 11 points to that player. Now looking up here in the corner, this player has three green tiles worth two points each. So there's six and their blue tile is only worth one point. So they have seven. Now let's see if this corner player made the right decision by ending the round. They have two yellows, that's 10 points total. They have a green, so there's another two and one point for the red. So they got 13 points and they won the round. 
Now these points are gonna be added up after we do four rounds. So you just switch start players, you move to the player to the left, they become the start player, and you just do that four times total. So you just play through the game until the round ends, switch start players, and go again. Now, if there's a tie at the end when you add up all your points, you just play one more round and you just keep going until you know there's no longer a tie. In the rule book, it gives you a few hints for the first time you play. So let's go over these because I think these are kind of helpful if you don't know where to begin. It says, don't worry about which number you play on your first turn. Chances are this won't be the last number played in the color. What's important are the last numbers. Again, that's the final value of each color is the last number. Zeros and fives are the most powerful numbers you can play. So depending on which you play and when, you can use these to boost the value of your quandary tiles or lower the value of your opponent's quandary tiles. It also suggests that you watch what other players take as their tiles. Is someone hoarding red or avoiding yellow? They might have zeros and fives still in their racks. But again, there's always those two tiles that don't make it into the game, so you can never be 100% sure of what's out there still. Number four is a great strategy tip. It says if zero, one, and two of the same color have been played already, that could be a good color to collect because the end value might be anywhere from three up to five points. So you have to think about these things when you're placing your tiles, as well as when you're analyzing the board and trying to deduce which numbers are left. You don't wanna give away too much information when you place a tile. You know, if the zero and the one have already been played, you definitely don't wanna play the two because everybody at the table is gonna suddenly jump on that color because they know that all that's left is the three, four, and five. So you always wanna keep your opponents guessing. Again, it's very subtle, but it's just a neat little, you know, bluffing and deduction type of game as well. Now, number five says, if you have three or more number squares in any one color, you can almost control that color group. Take advantage of this. And there's some truth to that. Now, when you play the game, that's harder than it sounds because you know, you're know you watching all the colors and stuff, but just knowing when to play the certain numbers and colors is agonizing. And I love that about the game, but you know that one is a little bit harder than it sounds. You don't necessarily control that color, but it does give you a bit of an advantage in that color, and you just need to kind of keep that in mind. The final thought there just reminds you that there's always two or three tiles left out of play. This uncertainty is guaranteed to keep you in a quandary. So I have to give this a nine out of 10 because this is the type of game that will always have a place in my collection. It's beautifully produced. You can play this with all different age groups and types of gamers. It's very versatile in that regard. It's very addictive, especially considering how easy it is to learn. And it's so brilliantly designed. I mean, if I was gonna explain Reiner Knizia to someone who's never played a Reiner Knizia game, I would show them quandary. This just sums up his style perfectly. How can a game this simple be so fun? You know, when you first hear the rules, you're like, what, that's all? And then you just sit down and you try it and you're like, huh, that's kind of interesting. Let's try that one more time. Now I've noticed a lot of these older Milton Bradley Parker Brothers, you know, family games, they like to do the scoring where you just play the same game for several rounds and just tally up your scores. I'm not usually a fan of that because a lot of times it just drags on and it seems like you're just doing the same thing over and over again. That is not the case with Quandary. Every round feels fresh and it feels like a different puzzle to solve, especially because you always have those two or three tiles that are left out of the game, so you can never be totally sure which numbers are left, as well as just the random distribution of tiles to each player. Every round feels extremely different. It never gets repetitive or samey like some of those other you know, older games do. So I think the scoring is very fitting for this game, and it is, as the box says, a nice little game of scheming and plotting. Now my daughter prefers the Botswana edition, also known as Wildlife Safari, and you can probably see why. It comes with these awesome little animal figures, and you know, anytime I've played this with kids, they always want to play this version of the game, obviously. Now some of the gamers out there might like this as well because the box is way smaller. You know, it's just cards and animals. There's no board here. Now generally speaking, I always prefer a game board in board gaming. This game particularly, I think 
distinct benefits from a board, and I'll show you why in a second. Now you'll notice there's only five of each animal. These represent the quandary tiles. There's actually six quandary tiles of each color in the other game. This only has five. I don't know really how that affects the game. I haven't noticed a difference uh, in playing both. So the lion here always makes me laugh. Let's get that out of the way. It's a goofy picture of a lion, but um, it just always cracks me up. I don't know why. So these cards, you're gonna deal these out. These act as the number tiles, and you're gonna have, you know, zero to five of each animal. And you just play an animal and take an animal, just like you do in the other game. So you're gonna just deal cards out to each player until you run out of cards, and you're gonna have like two or three left over, just like you do in the other game. So again, you just play one card and then take any animal that you want. And it works the exact same way. You keep playing until all the numbers of a single animal have been played, then the round ends and you score it the same way. Now, this is where the game board comes in handy. It's kind of hard to look around and keep track of which numbers have been played. The game board has those pathways, which make it much easier to visualize, you know, which numbers have been played, which colors are running out and things like that. Now, there's a couple very minor differences in the games. For instance, up here, it says two to five players. Quandary is two to four players. This is ages seven and up. Quandary is 14 and up. The seven and up is way more in line with what it should be. I would even say six and up. Now, when you're playing with two and four players, you're gonna still remove the two cards randomly. And with three players, you're gonna remove three cards. But with five players, you're gonna use all the cards. So there's not gonna be that hidden information. And that does change the game a little bit. Also, this game, you play as many rounds as there are players. Now that's pretty much the same, except with two players. In Quandary, you're supposed to play four rounds. And in Botswana, with two players, you only play two rounds. So these are just minor differences. The gameplay is the same. I just wanted to do a quick comparison so you can decide what your preference is. You know, box size, components, and things like that. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Make sure you click like on the video and subscribe to the channel so you can learn about more undiscovered games games in the future. If you've ever played Quandary or Botswana or any of the versions of this game, make sure you comment below. I'd love to hear which one you like the best. And if you want to help the channel even more, you can consider donating to the PayPal link in the description. You can donate any amount you want, and it just helps keep the channel going and produce better quality content in the future. We're still brand new. We're still trying to grow. So even just subscribing and sharing this video with your friends is a huge help and motivates me to continue making these videos and sharing these undiscovered games with you. So that's all for this video. I will see you on the next one. Thanks for watching.